wife sends her greetings. She's in Texas right now. And so that's where we've been. And uh, it's great to be back here. It's great to be here with you all. And uh, I just love you all so much. We love your heart for us, your heart for our congregation, and your heart for Israel, the Jewish people. And uh, we're just, uh, it's just a, it's an amazing time every time I come here. There's something very special because of that fire that is kept burning on the altar. And uh, the very first thing that I learned when I, when I came to know Jesus was I learned prayer and fasting. The Holy Spirit taught me. I didn't have anybody. I didn't have a, a church to go to, nothing. I got saved in somebody's house. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a literal overnight trans, transformation. And so God is, is uh, he does powerful things when you connect through prayer and you disconnect from the world through fasting. Prayer will cultivate a hunger for the eternal. Fasting will activate the hunger for the eternal because you are deactivating your hunger for the temporary. You're deactivating your hunger for temporary food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs> uh, so, Ruach Kodesh, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here to minister to our hearts, to give understanding to our minds. Your understanding, Lord, is supernatural. It cannot be devised by common sense of man. It cannot be logicized by human intellect. It can't be intellectualized in any capacity uh, outside of you, Lord. And so as Isaiah 11 speaks of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, Father, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and understanding opening our eyes to what you want to reveal tonight. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start off, I, Pastor Bernardo and, and Gary, they're over at, at our congregation in New City, and so uh, <laughs> Pastor Gary was in Texas a few weeks ago, and we had a meeting, and he said, hey, uh, can you speak on, on Friday at, at the encounter service? I said, sure, let's do it, and so it's, it's a great swap. They're under, I, I, I don't think they're under the sukkah tonight. If, if they're raining, then yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, but... Uh, I've got the lulav here for you all. Uh, so I, said, I was praying, and, and the Lord started speaking to me because I, usually when, when, I, when I preach, it comes out very prophetic. But how many of you all know that you need sound teaching and you need sound preaching? I know you get that here. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here if you were a bunch of just weirdo, you know, like, you know, if it was a cult and you were waiting to get beamed out of the sky by a spaceship, I'd be like, you know what, you drink your own Kool-Aid, I'm out of here. Uh, but, you know, there are some, some ministries are like that, they're a little too spacey, you know, like, uh, you know, you want to be heavenly minded, yes, but not not floating, uh, not doing anything with, with what you have. So faith will blast you in the new heights in the spirit. Faith will blast you in the new places of God's glory, but teaching will establish you. Teaching will bring you to the place where you are bringing the things of God into transformation and implementation and application in your life and what God has called you to and what God has called you for. And God has called all of us, Jew and Gentile, to glorify and magnify his name. That's the heart of the Jewish people, to kiddushat Hashem, to, to sanctify God's name. And it was the first thing that Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. It's, it should be the heartbeat that we have, that we should give glory and honor and magnify the name of Jesus. No name higher than that name. Uh, I, I, I know that there are some of you who are interns. How, how many are interns tonight? Am I embarrassing you? No? Okay, all right. Well, hey, it's a blessing for you all to be here. You've been doing an Israel intensive, right? Okay, you have. have you, has it been good? Has, has God been dealing with you? It, we, uh, my wife and I, I've been in Jewish ministry for 23 years, and, and seven years uh, of that was at Gateway Church in Southlake with Pastor Robert Morris. And I, I, I had a lady come up to me, 
in a class one time, and she, she said, I need to repent to you. And I said, for what? Uh, she said, well, when I found out that Gateway had a Jewish ministry, I was disgusted. And I was, I was blown. Uh, yeah, that my, 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 my was like, what? Uh, I, I was, well, okay. She said, I, I never knew Jewish people, and, and I didn't know I had anti-Semitism. And God's been dealing with me every time I see anything Jewish, something rises up in me. And uh, she, she, she got set free by just that act, not because it was me, but because as a representative of the Jewish people, you know, that, that was... That was what God was doing. Um, and so we have a, a heart to really help the, the church understand not just the Jewish roots. You can understand the Jewish roots, but God's heart for you understanding the Jewish roots is so that you will be able to reach Jewish people. It's not just to admire all the Jewish accoutrements and, and things like that. You know, it's to reach Jewish people who don't even know their Messiah. Now, I had some notes that I sent to Pastor Bernardo, and I sent them kind of late because I wasn't planning to give notes. I was just like, I'm going to get up there, and I'm going to light a fire. And it, not literally. Don't, don't take that. Somebody took that the wrong way one time and sent me a blowtorch. And I said, you know, I, gotta st- I can't say stuff like that because they're, they're, you know, imbalanced people. It's a nice way of saying that. But I want to ask you this. If God wanted to invite you to a party, would you go? Hmm? I like, I like partying. People never invited me to parties when I was in the world. They thought I was too unhinged. Uh, and, and so it worked out because God sanctified the unhinged and, and then, you know, made me a threat to the devil. Uh, but if God wanted to invite you to a party, you would want to go, I guarantee, because it would be the best party that you've ever been to, okay? Now, if you have your Bible or electronic devices, I would like you to turn to Leviticus 23, the Leviticus 20, all right, you like Leviticus, all right, no one's ever done that. How many have read through Leviticus? All right, a couple of people, that, that's, that's really good. Someone, I went one place one time, and one person raised their hand, and, and uh, the guy was like a computer analyst, which figures. Um, Leviticus is kind of like the book of calculus for Christians, you know. They, they just, they read it, and they just all of a sudden start glitching. Okay. Leviticus 23 lists all the feasts of Israel. There are seven feasts of Israel, beginning with the Sabbath. Tonight, as the sun has gone down, we have entered into the seventh day, the Shabbat. We have also entered into the first night of the last feast that is listed in Leviticus 23, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And so at our congregation, we have a large sukkah which is made out of wood, and it's just an impermanent structure. Now, if, if I want to speak to you tonight about this feast, but there's a specific angle that the Holy Spirit has given to me. So I want to speak to you about the Sukkot blueprint for the end of days. That is the Sukkot blueprint for the end of days. The feasts contain the key to your faith, they contain keys to your identity, and they, con- they contain keys to your destiny. I'm going to say that again. As individuals in Jesus, Yeshua, the feasts of Israel contain keys to our faith. Why is that? Because the feasts are fulfilled in him. That means the feasts have something to say about his life, about his redemptive work, and what he's called us to do through the Great Commission. Secondly, they, the, 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 the feasts of Israel have keys to our destiny because they all take place at a specific time and a specific place. That means there is an appointment for you and I. We know that appointment is going to be when he returns. And we're all, all of humanity is going to stand face to face with the living son of God. The feasts also contain keys to your life in God in that There is something fundamental and existential uh, about your life in God that you can glean from the feast. So sometimes people get overboard when they start studying the feasts of Israel and they start studying the Jewish roots. And and it it almost becomes like a, a bewitching of the book of Galatians where they get into obligation instead of invitation. God is all about invitation for his beloved. 
okay? There are covenant obligations. I'm not going to get into that. There is a distinction in vocational calling between Jews and a distinction of vocational calling in the Lord between Gentiles. Uh, it goes the same for men and women. All of us are able to enter into covenant through the blood of Jesus, but thank God I stayed a man. And thank God, ladies, you stayed, stayed ladies, okay? Now, something about the feast, I'm going to build up step by step this message. So I don't want you to get stuck on some of the, the fine details and particulars that you might think, oh, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? I missed what he said. Uh, don't worry about that. I want you to get the main concept. The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who took three measures of, of meal and, and hit it. She took a, a measure of meal and hit it, hit it in that, that, and, and that leaven and it expanded. All you needed to catch is one thing that the Holy Spirit has for you tonight and nurture it with prayer and with seeking God and watch it grow. And watch it develop something in you. So Sukkot is the last of the feasts of Israel. It is also the third of a specific type of feast called the Shiloshet Regalim, which means the pilgrimage feasts. Now, the three pilgrimage feasts are Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. These are the large feasts that all the men in Exodus 23 had to go to Jerusalem for those feasts. Now, they had to go and present themselves before the Lord because that was, what God, that was what God required. Those three feasts are, are they contain the, what we call a narrative of theme um, of, of Jewish, uh, how do I put it? They, they're a narrative theme, and they create a framework for how we understand the Old Testament in Judaism. Because Passover is all about new creation. God brought Israel out of Egypt and, and he made them new. When you came under the Passover blood of Jesus, you became a new creation, right? If you're here and you're an old creation, then we want you to come into the family of God. But if you're an intern, hopefully you already are because you're an intern. So Passover is all about new creation. Pentecost is all about revelation, the revelation of the Torah that took place in, at Mount Sinai. Uh, and then you have the revelation in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into this separate teaching, but, but if you just looked at the parallels between both of those, at Sinai, 3,000 Jews died with the revelation of the law. With the revelation of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 Jewish people got saved. On Mount, at, at, on Mount Zion at the temple. That's why they were all there at the temple. There were Jews who went from all the nations around because of this, the dispersion. And so they went back. So, you know, th there weren't different nations there. They were all Jewish people from the nations. And sometimes commentators miss that. So then you have tabernacles. What is tabernacles? Tabernacles is all about the actualization and the fullness of redemption. It is the culmination of everything. It is Israel's largest feast. I love it. You get to, you get to sit outside and you live in a, in a hut, and uh, you get to have plants all around you and, and uh, sit under the stars and have friends over and eat and and it's like camping. And I love camping. My wife doesn't. She wants, you know, she, her idea of camping is a spa, you know, on maybe Hawaii or something like that. Um, so when we look at the feast, the Sabbath, Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, uh, first fruits before Pentecost, and then you have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. We're in the middle, we're right at the end of this high holy day season that began a few weeks ago with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and then Yom Kippur, and tonight begins Sukkot. All these feasts, I just told you about how the feasts contain keys to your personal life and your walk with God. 
The feasts also contain a framework of revival and resurrection for Israel and the nations. They contain the plan of God for reconciliation. And then the future hope of all humanity, Jew and Gentile, for redemption and resurrection. Redemption and resurrection. The actualization of the kingdom, Romans 9, 15. You don't have to turn there, but it says if they're, if they're rejection, if they're casting away men acceptance for the nation, what, 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 or life, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? In other words, Israel is the only nation on the planet in history that God has said if this group of people get saved, it will mean life and revival for the entire world. Life and revival for the entire world. Uh, I have a message that I, that I call the blu, a blueprint, and, and I have a friend who wrote a book called God's Blueprint for the Great Commission, and um, he stole it from me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, he, he didn't. He's one of my mentors. But it's, it's really about God's blueprint and his framework. When you look in Exodus, I'm laying a foundation here. When you go to Exodus chapter 25, God's speaking to Moses about the building of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle blueprint becomes really the blueprint for the temple that Solomon builds in 1 Kings 8. Now, God said something to Moses. He said, see that you make it according to the tavnit, according to the pattern that I show you on the mountain. He said in Exodus 25, verse 9, verse 40, Exodus 26, verse 30, he said over and over, he told him several times, make it according to the pattern. How many of you understand if, you know, people, we're pretty, we're pretty repetitive, you know. We're, we sometimes, you know, we get a little OCD with the, some things. Well, God said, if God came to you and said, you know what, I, I want you, I'm going to give you a formula for how to get rich. You would grab onto that thing like, yeah, man, give it to me. We look for formulas. We look for ways to do things. This whole building was built because you had architects, you had engineers, you had construction workers who were looking at blueprints. And thank God they were looking at blueprints because you don't want to walk in and have the roof fall on you. The reason we have blueprints, we have measures, we have gauges is because we want things to turn out the way they're supposed to. If you don't know how to cook, I'm not going to ask who doesn't know how to cook in here, but if you don't know how to cook, you're going to get a recipe and you're going to follow the measurements for every ingredient so it'll actually taste the way it looks. You hear what I'm saying? You ever saw something that looked really good? Oh, man, it looks amazing. Like, Whoa, what did they put? A pint of salt in there? You want it to taste the way it looks. God says to Moses, I want you to make the tabernacle according to everything that I show you, according to the pattern. Now, now understand this. Israel always understood the tabernacle and the temple to be a copy of the real thing in heaven. It's not a Christian innovation. They always understood that. That's what it says. God told Moses, make it according to the pattern of what I'm showing you. Uh, Solomon, when he dedicated the temple in 1 Kings 8, he said, hey, when, when your people sin and we come before you to your temple, the place where you put your name, hear from your dwelling place. Solomon knew this thing that I'm building is just a copy of the real one. But I've been given blueprints. I've been given a framework for how to build something that will be representational of what God wants to manifest in the earth. Of what God wants to do in the earth. Now the temple is based on blueprints. Okay? The temple is in dimensional space. It is three-dimensional. It exists within creation. So if God gave a blueprint for his glory in three-dimensional space, God also must have given a blueprint for a representation of what he wants to manifest in time and in history. We call that the Sabbath. Why? 
because the Sabbath is a temple in time as the temple is a Sabbath in space. The Sabbath is a temple in time as the temple is a Sabbath in space. What both are doing is they are providing Israel with a framework for how to build according and and to situate time and to situate their lives around the things of God and what God wants to manifest in the earth. Is everybody following me? No. Okay. The temple is like the Sabbath in that God manifests his glory in the temple. And the Sabbath is a day of rest where we're supposed to rest with God. We're supposed to rest in his glory. So one is in, is in three-dimensional space. In creation, the other is in time. Okay? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. You always have time and space linked together. It's, that's why we call it the, the space-time continuum. Okay? Einstein didn't discover it. The Bible said it right there, Genesis 1. Actually, that's where Einstein got it from. It's a true story. Now, when we look at the Sabbath in Leviticus 23, you look up at verse 1, the Lord spoke again to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, These are the Lord's appointed times. Now, who does it say they belong to? The Lord's. That means they don't belong to Israel. He gave them to Israel. Exodus 4.22 says Israel is God's firstborn. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, he says, you know, to them pertain the adoption. In other words, that's why uh, they're, they're called the first fruits of redemption. They're called the, 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 the ones to whom the, the, ado the, the adoption pertains. And so that's why when, when we are, uh, those who are not Jewish, they come, they get grafted in to that adoption, that original adoption. So these feasts belong to the Lord. He says, for six days may work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. A holy convocation. You will not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. Now the Sabbath, the Sabbath has a dual role. Okay, remember Genesis chapter 2, it says, God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Well, God comes to Israel on Mount Sinai and he gives the, the Torah the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy to Moses. And in Exodus 20, the Sabbath is put forth in its creative role because it pre-existed the nations. It pre-existed Israel. It pre-existed before man was created. Uh, 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 not before man was created, but before the nations. It was, it was set forth creatively. In Deuteronomy 5, there is a relisting of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5 is not presented creatively because in Exodus 20, he says, make sure you only do six days of work because on the seventh day, the Lord rested after he created everything. Deuteronomy 5 is different. The Sabbath is presented redemptively. He says, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you into, into rest, basically. So the Sabbath sets the precedence for all the feasts of Israel. Because all the feasts of Israel are Sabbaths. There's no work done on them. So if you go to Leviticus chapter, uh, the same chapter, but the end of it, when it speaks about Sukkot in chapter 34, again the Lord spoke, I'm in verse 33, not chapter 34, I'm sorry. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day is a holy convocation. You will not do any laborious work of any kind. The first day is the Sabbath. You go to the last day, which is called the eighth day, and he says, 
again, you're not going to do any, 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 any work. He says that in verse 36, seven days you will present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you will have a holy convocation. Present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly. You will do no laborious work. So the first day and the last day are Sabbaths. Okay? Now, because the feasts, all the feasts are Sabbaths, all the feasts speak towards creation and redemption. Creation and redemption. What's the first feast that kicks it off with creation? It's Passover. What's the, the feast that finishes it all? It's Sukkot. It's the feast of redemption. So you have what is happening is the plan of God is being unfolded through time. Just as the work of God was being unfolded in the temple. You had the plan of God unfolding in time. And what's happening is every year as Israel, as the feasts are being celebrated by Israel, is the plan of God is being rehearsed. It's being reenacted. And in fact, the, the terminology in Hebrew, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, Pastor Bernardo will, will send out uh, my notes. Um, to, to those of you that have that, that uh, ask him on the email or whatever, and you'll get some of the Hebrew terminology. I, I don't want to get into to all of it. Uh, but that's the terminology behind it because the word moed, feast, means an appointed time. But the word mikrai kodesh, holy convocation, literally means a holy rehearsal in Hebrew. A holy rehearsal. All right? Now, what did God say to Moses? He said, See that you make the tabernacle according to the pattern that I've given you, that I've shown you on the mountain. And if we, as we've just established, if there's a blueprint for holiness in three-dimensional space, there's a blueprint for holiness in time. Okay? Let me see that shofar real quick. I want to show you something. Look at it like this. All of time... Is, is heading down a spiral. And the beginning of all history is like the bell of this horn. The end of it is like this. All pointing one to one central place. Thank you. Why? Because everything is running down the corridor of time, and it seems like time is getting shorter. In fact, last year, the earth sped up by like half a millisecond or something like that. It, it's, the earth is literally speeding up, and the sequence of time is running down the quarter of history to a central place, to a central moment. Where is that moment? It is the Feast of Sukkot, according to Zechariah 14, when the Messiah will come down on the Mount of Olives, the place, time and place, and what will happen is there's going to be a big earthquake because... That will signify that the Lord has returned. Now, we don't know. We know it's going to be around the fall feast. We know that because the fall feasts have not been fulfilled yet. The, the spring feasts of Passover, first fruits, and Pentecost have been fulfilled. The fall, the fall feasts have yet to be fulfilled. And if you go to Zechariah chapter 12 real quick, I can show that to you. Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14. I was told I could be comprehensive with you all because you were going to have an intensive the whole week. So I said, okay, well, if I can be a little more comprehensive, okay. Zechariah 12, what's going to happen is verse 10, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his bechor, his only son. That's the same term, the bechor, that's used for the firstborn lamb, the lamb in Exodus. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn, a bechor. Uh, that's the term, actually. Um, in that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the morning at Hadar Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves. This passage thematically is Rosh Hashanah because this is what is happening. Jewish people are repenting during Rosh Hashanah. 
You go to Zechariah 13. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. What is that? That's Yom Kippur. That's Yom Kippur. And then we get to Zechariah 14. And what happens? Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken. The house is rifled. The women ravished. Half of the city will go into captivity, but the remnant of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. And what's going to happen is that when you go down to verse 16, it says, It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. I love this. I, I think it's like God's sense of humor. I like how he does things, you know. He's like, okay, you came up to destroy my people. Your punishment, you're going to have to come worship me in, in, in my city. It shall come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations who came against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles, the feast of Sukkot. It shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. Why is that significant? Because Sukkot is when Jewish people pray for rain. If the family of Egypt won't come up and enter in, they will have no rain. They'll receive the plague the Lord strikes the nations with, who don't come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. And in that day, Kodesh Ladonai, holiness to the Lord, will be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices will come take them and cook in them. And in that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. That means an unclean person. So you have the full actual, actualization of redemption that is met out here at the very end and the transition of the age. Where everything is made holy unto God, the way the high priest had a breast had a had a not a breastplate. Um, he had a breastplate, but not on his head. That that'd be weird. Uh, but he had a crown that said Kodesh Ladonai that had that said holiness to the Lord. Everything will be holy. Everything will be redeemed. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So. If you've, been, if you've been taking a little bit of notes, I want you to catch this first. Sukkot is a blueprint for the end of days. That's the biblical term for the la, la, you know, the, the, all the craziness. The, the harit hayamin. Now, it's really not the end of days. You know why? Because it's not the end of days for the righteous. It's the end of days for the wicked. I, I, I get tired of hearing believers kvetch and complain all the time and look what's going on with the government and look at the liberals and, and look at the, what's going on and, and oh, we're in the last days. We're in the, you would think that you're the one who's going to die and go to hell. Get some chutzpah. Get, 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 get some, uh, you know, nachas. I, I don't know what, the, you know what. Get, get, get some, you know, get some resolve. You're, you're, it's not the end of days for you. It's the end of days for the wicked. I was in prayer one day, and the Lord said, the days are coming when my people have to come out of the cave, have to come out of the closet. You know, the church has been going into the closet while the alternative lifestyles have been coming out of the closet. But the book of Revelation doesn't say you're going into a cave. The book of Revelation says that the wicked are going into a cave the book of revelation says they're going to be hiding from his face calling for the rocks to fall on them that's the thing that awaits us is the glory of his face that we want to embrace and come out of our place of hiding you know god had seven i'm preaching now I'm not even teaching. God told Elijah, he said, you know, I got 7,000 dudes reserved for me, and they were hiding somewhere. But he didn't tell Elijah to go hide in a cave in Mount Horeb. He told him uh, several times, you know, hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? 
And God's saying that to some of you. And God's saying, I don't know if this is online, but it's saying that to you online as well. What are you doing here? We're in the days of Elijah. You want the anointing of Elijah? You ready to go live by a ditch and get fed by some ravens? Huh? You ready to be homeless? Look at Torben Sodergaard, the pastor that was the Danish pastor who was just released and it was in, in prison by the United States. Sakota Blueprint for the end of days. But it is not just eschatological in scope, it is evangelistic in scope. It's not just eschatological in scope. What is that word eschatology? It just means last study of last things. Good. Gary's doing a good job. I'm 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 yeah, I'm gonna get him a candy bar or something. Uh <laughs> It means the study of last things. Now, when, when we look at Sukkot, it is the feast for the end of days. We get that understanding from the rabbis in the second temple period. That's where we get that understanding from. The rabbis, they understand that Sukkot is a feast for the last days, and it's also a feast for the nations. But... In the Old Testament, Sukkot is never uh, set forth as having anything to do with the end days. The emphasis in the Old Testament with Sukkot is the place, the place, the temple. The second temple period, the rabbis began to see, hey, you know what, it's not just the place, it's the timing. Why is that? Because Sukkot is so tied up with the temple. And there's a temple. There's a temple that's going to be built in Israel. The false Messiah is going to try and sit in it, declare himself to be God, but then the real Messiah is going to come and kick him out. You know? It, it, the, it's called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the book of the revelation of Antichrist. Okay? Everybody trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. I don't care who he is. Why do I care who he is? Somebody asked me today, hey, Rabbi, what do you think about the Nephilim and aliens? I don't care. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to spend eternity with him. What do I care about that nonsense? Believers getting worked up all over stuff that they, you know, it's almost like Christian prognostication. Really? I don't even think the majority of the church knows what prophetic is anymore. You want, to, you want me to give you a, 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 just a real simple definition of what prophetic is? On earth as it is in heaven. That's the simplest definition of prophetic. Everybody says, well, you know, I got prophetic art and there's prophetic dancing and prophetic cooking. What is prophetic cooking? Like, are you making Ezekiel bread? Like, what, what is that? You know? <laughs> okay. But Sukkot, Sukkot is, is associated with the temple, and because the temple is about to re be rebuilt, and Israel is expecting the Messiah when they see the temple being rebuilt, then Sukkot is parallel not just with the end days, but also the ingathering of the nations, the ingathering of the Jewish people. In fact, that's the first name that Sukkot is given in Exodus 23. It's called Chagah Sith. The feast of the ingathering or the feast of the, the collection. In fact, the term used when, it, when God says in Leviticus 3 to take, to take the Arba Minim, the four species, he says, Lekach, Lekach them. It means to take with fervor. Take it with fervor. And, and the rabbis say, well, every one of these four species represents a type of person, a type of soul. Listen, God, God wants to see his body get off our back, get off our butt, put up, you put up or shut up, 
It, because, you know, six million Jews died because the church didn't speak up when policies were being passed. And the church didn't step up when the policies were being implemented. There was colonial slavery because the church didn't speak up against policies passed until Wilbur, Wilberforce stepped up. And when those policies were implemented, the church didn't step up. Well, now we've got some ideologies that are coming up and rising up in our face. And the devil's not afraid to equip our children at six years old of things that they shouldn't know until they're probably 16 years old. And we haven't spoken up with the policies. Now it's time for us to step Step up. God wants us to take the nations with fervor, take the souls with fervor. For you to get, if you get a heart for Israel, it's not just, well, what did the rabbi say? Oh, that's amazing. Can I get a talit and, and sing with the talit on? No, it's to go and take the message, the gospel to the Jewish people. There are 3.1 Jewish people, 3.1 million Jewish people in this, in this tri-state area who have no clue. They don't know anything about Jesus, their Messiah. It's about the full proclamation of the gospel. Why is that? Well, because the code is eight days. The first seven days, you have 13 bulls slaughtered on the first day. Uh, on the first day. And, and the, way it's, the way it happens is it's a countdown. It's a countdown. There are 13 bulls slaughtered on the first day of Sukkot. There are 12 bulls slaughtered on the second day of Sukkot. There's 11 days slaughtered on the, on the 11th day of, of the 10th day. I'm, I'm losing count here because I'm my, my, my spirit's going faster than my mind. That's why. Listen, when you go through Leviticus 23, Numbers 28, 29, I'm sorry. That's Numbers 28 and 29. When you look at the amount of offerings that are given on Sukkot, the number of bulls that are given those first seven days is 70. That refers to the 70 original nations that are found in Genesis chapter 10. If you take the number of lambs, there are 14 lambs every day the first seven days. Those 14 lambs add up to 98. Why 98? Because there are 98 curses in Deuteronomy 28. So what Israel is doing is Israel's making atonement for the nations to redeem the nations from the curse of the law. And listen, the curse has everyone under the law, Jew and Gentile. The gospel has a curse attached to it too, but it's for those who pervert and distort it. And it's, we got to get our message right. And it has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Sukkot is dualistic. What do I mean by that? I mean that every aspect of it has a twofold nature, two components to it. It's a feast for Israel and the nations because the last day, the eighth day, is a feast for Israel all by itself which is amazing because it's one feast, but then when that extra day, the rabbis actually ask, well, if it's one feast, but it's actually two. How is that? It has two Sabbaths. And, of course, the Sabbath has a dual role of creative, which is universal, and redemptive, which is particular. There are two major rites in Sukkot, which is, the taking up of the four species, and then the building of a sukkah. So you're waving one, and you're dwelling in the other. The waving of this lulav, this, these four species represent the fertility of the promised land, but dwelling in the sukkah is a reminder of wandering and exile. Two components. This feast is called in Hebrews, man simchateinu, the time of our rejoicing. And yet, it is the period in time, it is the period in human history when the worst wars will occur. Which is why we read Zechariah 14 during this time. And why we also read Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the wars of Gog and Magog. And the wars of Gog and Magog are not one war, it's a, se it's several bat a series of battles. I'm sure Gary's gone into that in, in his podcast. But, you know... It's paradoxical that, that Sukkot is the, the season of our rejoicing, and yet it's also considered to be the worst time in human history. Huh?
It's a time for our season of our rejoicing. You know, some believers, they don't feel like they're spiritual unless they're miserable. Huh? They're, they, don't, they don't feel like they're spiritual unless they're miserable or making somebody miserable. Shaking the fist at, 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 the, at unbelievers like, like they, they oh, oh, I'm holy. You got to get holy. I'm shaking my fist at you. You need to be ashamed. Shaking their fist at, at, at the world and the media. You know, I, I'm fed up with people saying that the media is the biggest false prophet in the land. God never gave the media the message of the gospel to give to the nations. He gave it to the church. The biggest false prophets are, are among us. The media is unsanctified, undelivered, unsaved. We're the ones who have that message. What do we learn when we say, okay, you know what? This is the time of our rejoicing, but it's also the worst time in the world. Well, I'm going to tell you. Because it's human nature to go to the extreme. Huh? During this time of Sukkot, we read the book of Ecclesiastes, which is all about how everything is temporary. And living in a sukkah, this flimsy little impermanent thing, is about how everything is temporary. It's human nature to go to the extreme. And what, what, what we in the body of Christ have done is we have preached the right thing the wrong way. And the right thing the wrong way is still the wrong thing. If you have truth without love, you have a lie. Huh? If you have love without truth, you have a perversion. When it comes to things like end time prophecy, we need, to be, we need to be studying that. There are 150 chapters in the Bible that all speak towards the last days. The Bible speaks more about our time than it does the time of Yeshua, the time of Jesus. 150 chapters. But what do we do with all of that? We get paranoid with it. We get conspiratorial. Well, Kanye West, is he a clone? I think he's a clone. Look at his shoulders. What nonsense? What message us? Is Katy Perry a, a lizard lady? You know, all kinds of nonsense. Bigfoot is real. You know, he's, he's, he's really the brains behind the, 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 the administration currently. Um, you know, it's just, it's just there's all kinds of weirdness. We wind up with this, you know, if we go that direction, then we get into like a spiritual pride type of thing. Well, I'm getting off this planet, and, and its whole thing's going to burn up. Huh? Hmm? A majority of believers tend to look at the end times with a sort of either spiritual pride or paranoia. Okay? And, and what happens is they try to match up prophecy with daily in the events, in, events in the news. Now, here's why both extremes are wrong and why you need to get a, a, a healthy approach to, to, to looking at end-time prophecy and events with the heart of God to complete the Great Commission. Instead of going and looking at what the media says and with the fear of the infatuation and all that stuff. Because then what you do is you filter the things that are written that are about to happen. You filter it through a carnal mind. Pastor Gary wrote a book about two doors that will remain open through the end of the age. One is intercession, the other is evangelism. The, uh, Jesus didn't say in, 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 in uh, Matthew 24, he, he, he didn't say, hey, you know what? Well, you're just going to have to go sit in a cave somewhere because the, it's, the world's going to be too dark. He told the disciples everything that was going to escalate, and it was going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And you know what I love the most about chapter 24 and 25 of Matthew is that the disciples actually shut up and listened to him. They didn't say a thing throughout those chapters. I think they, I think they were like, I think he totally really had them. And he said, it's, this is going to happen, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes. And he, he says, the end is not yet. What was the thing that was going to kick off the end? He said, the preaching of the gospel to all the nations, that's going to set the end off. Listen, he's in control of this, not the U.S. government. He's in control of this. He's going to lead us in triumph, not triumphalism. 
Yeah, some of us might be like Elijah, living in a ditch, uh, being fed by ravens. We might not be in the palaces. One of the things that, that I've seen happen with a lot of believers when they get into the, the end of days is, is they, they get this focus on all the darkness around it. How, how, in, 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 let, let's be real. How many of us, we got pretty uh, responsive and reactive when the thing happened in 2020? Huh? We, we got very reactive and very responsive and people on social media and believers were butting heads with other believers over, you know, a little injection. Huh? When you start focusing on all that stuff and you just retain the darkness of it, what happens is it burns up your spiritual calories. And what you need is a higher in intake calorically when it comes to the things of the spirit and the word of God. Hmm? Because a persistent negativism that you expose yourself to is spiritually dangerous. And what God, what Jesus said we needed for the last days, he said we needed endurance. I, 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 I used to be a long distance runner. And one thing that I knew that I had when I was going to run, uh, you know, how many, however many miles I was going to run, I knew I had, to, I had to eat because my metabolism was going to burn. It was, I was, sky, my metabolism was going to hit skyrocket, as, you know, if I'm doing 7, 13, 15 miles, 20 miles, stuff like that. And the days that are coming upon us are days where we're going to need more of the word of God. We're going to need more prayer, more worship. Why? Because the trials that we will be in, having to endure through will require more of a spiritual caloric intake for our metabolism in the things of God. You will have to be feasting on the bread of life. You will have to be feasting on the bread of life. When we look at Sukkot, all of the major elements of this feast are characteristics of war in the Bible. I don't, I'm not going to get into it. Oh, I forgot to change my time on my watch. 8.30. When you look at the sukkah, the roof of it is called a gag. It's called a gag. And it has, it has pretty much the, the same root as the name Gog, Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38. And, and, a, 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 and it's, a flimsy, it's a flimsy structure. And the rabbis, they say, hey, you know, the reason why there's a countdown with the bulls in relation to the nations is because the strength of the nations is decreasing the closer we get to the to Messiah coming. The strength of the nations is diminishing, and their ability to resist him is, oh, was that? Reminds me of my daughter. Uh, huh? Is that the ability of the nations to resist God, the nations are getting more, more, more paranoid. They're getting scared, more scared. Why? Because the strength of God is increasing in the last days. When we, I just told you about how this, uh, these four species, they are representative of the redemption of the ingathering of the Jewish people and also the ingathering of those from the nations who are joining arms with the Jewish people through Israel's Messiah and saying, we're going to go up with you to worship the king, your king. It's also the end gathering because what did he say in Zechariah 14? He also said it in the book of Joel. He said, I'm going to gather all the nations down. I'm going to gather them down. I'm going I'm to hook them and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Hamonim, hamonim, be'emech hecharutz. Hiyom karov Adonai, be'emech hecharutz. It's multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Huh? You thought you heard that you were going to give that at an altar call. It's not referring to an altar call. It's referring to him cutting down the nations who are going to destroy his people. He 
talked about the offerings of Sukkot. One of, the, one of the rabbis had this to say. He said, the offerings of Sukkot are unique. They include offerings to invoke protection for the Gentile nations. For the Gentile nations. Okay? Another rabbi had this to say. Had the na- the, actually, this is, in the, 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 this is in rabbinic literature. Had the nations of the world realized what benefit the temple was to them, they would have built fortifications around it to safeguard it, for it was of greater benefit to them than it was for Israel. As appears from the prayer of Solomon, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, 1 Kings 8, 41, goes, and he goes on to write, and do according for all which the foreigner calls on you. Now, I want to bring it home, because we talked about how Sukkot's a blueprint for the, for the end of days. We talked about how Sukkot has a dualistic two-part role. And now what I really want to get to the heart of is how Sukkot is a blueprint for ministry in the end of days. Why is that? Well, because Sukkot is all about building impermanent structures. And in today's day and age, many ministries have gotten used to doing the same thing over and over. And there are some ministries that haven't moved in 20 or 30 years with the Holy Spirit. Some of them haven't done anything different. They haven't changed anything because they have lost the breath of life through prayer. And they've lost unction through fasting. I had a a ministry leader's son ask me some questions about some social issues. And he said, I just don't know what to do about these issues because I, 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 just, I just feel confused. I said, you feel confused because you don't have conviction. And you don't have the anchor of the word. And if you did, you'd preach it. Instead of trying to give some nice, logical, rational answer that will make people accept you. There's going to come a, 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 you know, sometimes we have to draw a cold line in the sand where people will criminalize us and they will villainize us. And just accept it instead of trying to justify yourself. Jesus went to the cross, branded a criminal. He wasn't up there saying, well, I got three breaths left. Let me try and make a case for myself. I can preach like that because I've died like that. Hmm? So code is the blueprint for what ministry will look like in the last days. Some believers have the same theology as when they first got born again. Your theology should be changing. Why? Because you're changing and you're being transformed more into his likeness and his image. When you look at Elijah, Elijah was moving around. It was known that that he would move around. 1 Kings 18, 12, hey, I'm going to leave and the spirit of God's going to take you somewhere else. Jesus said in John 3, he said, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. You 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 don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. And so is everyone who's born of the spirit. Israel in numbers moved 42 times in 40 years being in the wilderness. Now, that was a judgment, okay? But then Sukkot is all about being reminded of that. And remembering God's kindness in the midst of that. Jesus spent three and a half years in ministry going from place to place. The apostles, man, when the Holy Spirit comes, they're all over the world. They're going all over the place. Matthew 17, 4 through uh, verse 6, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, if you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, three Sukkot, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, it doesn't mean that this was happening at the time of Sukkot. All it it means is that they were looking at it as the fulfillment of what they were expecting to happen, of what they were expecting Messiah to do. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly a voice came out of the loud came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. I love how gracious the translators are. Because God basically said, shut up. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, were greatly afraid. 
Listen, it was more important for them to hear his voice than it was for them to build a structure, even an impermanent one. We are coming to a time in history, we are coming to a time in the plan of God when it will be very critical for you to develop the the, the heart and the ears for the voice of the Lord because it will be critical that you hear and how you know where he is calling you, what he is calling you to do, how long you're supposed to be doing it so that you don't get stuck in trying to make what you're doing the foundation when the message is the foundation. The message is sacred. The method is not sacred. Things can change. We have to adapt. Look how quickly, overnight, the thing in 2020 shut down all all these ministries. It shut down how they were doing things. The ones that didn't adapt didn't survive. Why? Because they made their method more sacred than the message. What did the disciples do? They defaulted to what they knew, even though it was good, but it wasn't God's plan. They assumed how to approach the move of God in that moment with what was the established thing to do in response to what was happening because of the established expectation. They focused on what God was doing instead of the fact that they were just needing to be focused on God himself. The Messiah was there. They did what all the religions, uh, what all the sects of Judaism were teaching around them and taught them all their lives to do and expect. Sound familiar? God wouldn't have any of it. He said, listen. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Prayer keeps our ears and our hearts to God's voice and our feet to the Spirit's moving. Ministry is becoming more mobile and more flexible. You see this. Many, I've, I know a lot of believers selling their homes and getting you know, mobile homes. And, may, and I'm not saying that, that that's what has to be done. But at least our hearts have to be on the move with God as he's moving. We look at the last days. The last days are so unstable that even the earth is moving back and forth. The nations are in upheaval. Hmm? But you, you look at, at, at what Jesus talks about, the birth pangs. In, in order for something to be considered a birth pang, it has to touch the entire world. That's what happened in 2020. There are more birth pangs to come. The other day, we were at a, a gateway conference in Texas, and one of the things that stuck out to me was Christine Kane. She, she, she said, you know, uh, it, we, we've, in ministry, we've, we've, made more Saul's than David's. We, we, we have people who know how to do market planning instead of be marked by the cross. Well, I said, that's right. You know, the, the, if you look at the end time model for ministry, uh, when the Gentiles began to get saved en masse, the, the, the Jewish apostles had a meeting in Acts 15. And James quotes Amos 9, 11 through 12. What does it say? It says that, that God will rebuild the tabernacle of David, the Sukkot David. There's the model for what God wants to do and how he wants ministry done. In what he wants rebuilt so that the framework can be made for his presence to come. And if his presence is on the move, we can pick it up and we can adapt it with his presence wherever it's going. Maybe not literally or physically, but at least in the spirit. But then when you look at the model, then there's an emphasis on the man. Because he talks about the sukkah, David, the sukkah of David. And the last day's model for the believer is David. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. And he wanted to do what God called him to do no matter what. You might not be called to move from place to place physically, but God has called you to be on the move through the momentum that comes through praise, worship, intercession, and intimacy. Sukkahs, they're not permanent structures. They have a foundation. They can be moved on that foundation. You don't have to do things the same way as everybody else. 
God will manifest himself when you have the heart like David. And you're willing to go sometimes into the, into the camp of the Philistines. Huh? And, and you, you've slayed your lions, so now you can slay the giants. You've got to slay the lions and the bears before the giants. David was on the move. Saul was comfortable being disobedient. And he, he was presumptuous and, and didn't even know, uh, you know, really uh, when God rejected him. And it took a prophet to tell him God rejected him. I'm struck with the fear of God in just saying that. It took a prophet to open Saul's spiritual eyes for him to know that God rejected him. And yet the, the, the king was on the move. Today, the king is on the move. Today, the king is on the move in our midst. He's in the move. He's on the move in our nation. I sat with a, a, a young a family a few weeks ago whose daughter has embraced an alternative lifestyle. And uh, the Lord gave me a prayer and also a word that just as, as it, it appears what what the, the enemy is doing in her life. Maybe God has to get her out of the walls of the ministry they're in because that ministry hasn't been operating in power to de bring deliverance. And so God will put her out in at one of those alternative parades where believers are at, getting mocked, getting spit on, and deliverance will occur outside the four walls. God wants to do something outside the four walls of the church nowadays. Are you willing to embrace it? This is the end time model before the Lord comes back. Holy Spirit, we're here. We are. Lord, I thank you first of all for your anointing. I thank you first of all for being manifest to speak through me tonight, Lord. Lord, that you could do better with a donkey but you've got me and you've given me the grace to deliver your word. And Lord, as, as everyone here tonight, those who are interns, those who are not, Lord, you're saying something to your people in these last days. You are seeking to equip us within the intimacy that we have with you. You're seeking to equip us to not, set in permanent structures of how we think we want to do things to build a platform for ourselves, but rather to build a sukkah for your praise, your glory, and your honor. Holy Spirit, we are called the temple of the Lord. And Lord, as, as we go throughout our day, throughout our routine, in our family, we want your glory to be seen in us. Because if, you're, if your light is not seen in us, the light will not be revealed in the ministry. Lord, if we don't meet with you in prayer, we sure as heck, no, no one will meet you in our preaching. No one will meet you in our proclamation if we don't first meet with you in prayer. Once you, I, 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 let's just stand up. Let's give some reverence to God. Let's, let's just acknowledge him for what he's saying tonight, for what he's doing, for what he's done with you through this whole week, for what you've learned, for how he's changed your mind on certain things. If you want to come up to the altar, come up to the altar. I know that's always available.